Okay, it is four o'clock on the first full day of Mises U, the last session of the opening day. Some of you are probably a little tired, right? It's been a lot to absorb. Uh, and most of you look fresh. Some of you are looking a little bit ragged. I mean, Connor, well, I was kind of worried about him, but um, you know, some of you might have been thinking, I've been sitting here all day listening to these excellent uh, speakers, but rather long-winded speakers, and I could use a nap. So some of you might have, been, might have been considering blowing off this last lecture of the day, trying to sneak out back to the hotel. Now, of course, had you tried that, I mean, Mises Institute security would have stopped you on the grounds. You would have been tackled or one of the lasers would have gotten you. But, but, but maybe you didn't know that, and so you might have, you might have tried it, but um, you didn't, right? You're sitting here uh, at the end of a long day because you really want to learn about entrepreneurship. You want to understand better the Austrian approach to, to, uh, to analyzing entrepreneurship. You want to understand what role entrepreneurship plays in society. And you're looking forward to a really fantastic, excellent, entertaining, informative discussion. OK. Now, I'm not a professional actor like our speaker last night, but I, you know, but I can put a little pizzazz into it to try to, try to keep your attention up. Um, so the fact that you're here tells me that you anticipated that the value of coming to this talk uh, exceeded what Austrians would call the opportunity cost, right? The fact that you can't be back in the hotel taking a nap or playing a video game or you know whatever else you might be doing. Now, you don't know for sure that that's going to be the case, right? There's some uncertainty about how things are gonna play out. Now, I anticipate that at 4.45, uh, you will all be, I mean, most of you will be crying tears of joy because you've never heard a lecture this good in your life. You'll be shouting and people will be dancing and all that. Um, and, and every one of you will think, oh my goodness, I am so glad I came to the four o'clock lecture on Monday. I thought about skipping. Oh boy, am I glad I came because it was so good. I got much more out of it than I would have gotten out of a nap. Now, it's theoretically possible, practically this would never happen, but theoretically, some of you might get to the end of this 45 minute slot and, and think, you know, the nap might have been the better choice, <laughs> okay? I didn't understand what he was saying and I couldn't stay awake and I didn't learn anything, blah, blah, blah. So some of you might decide at the end of this hour, again, theoretically, uh, that you'd made a mistake. You know, that you'd made the wrong decision. You wish you had stayed home. You wish you had done something else uh, than come here. Now, if you believe that the benefits you got from attending this lecture exceeded the costs, we could say, if we wanted to, you earned a profit, right? You had a, a, net, a net gain. Benefits exceeded costs. Now, we don't have numbers exactly to put on that, but from your own subjective assessment of the situation, you gain more than you lost, you profited from being here. I mean, we sometimes even use that expression, right? I profited greatly from reading that book. You don't mean literally a money profit, you mean you, you, the benefits of reading the book, you know, exceeded the cost, right? Or if you decide that you wish you hadn't read the book, you might say, well, that was a huge loss, right? What a loss of my time I spent, you know, 45 minutes sitting here, I could have been doing something else. Again, it's a subjectively perceived loss, not necessarily a monetary loss. You don't have a number that you can attach to it, but you do have some sense of whether you benefited or not. Now, if you, you know, if as is likely the case, you got a huge profit, psychological subjective profit from coming here, you know, that may influence your decision in the future that may influence your behavior in the future. The next time there's a Peter Klein lecture on the docket, you are gonna be there, you're gonna be in the front row, right, eager and excited, ready to go. If you decided you earned a net loss, right, then you might decide to skip going forward. You might not be right in your future decisions, but you would have a little bit more information, right? You would have learned something from this experience that would guide you in the future. Okay, by deciding to show up, you engaged in entrepreneurship, right? You, you engaged in an entrepreneurial act in sitting here in this room today. What do I mean? Well, ex ante, before you had to choose to sit here or not, you weighed the anticipated costs against the anticipated 
benefits. You may not have done so very explicitly, you know, thinking it in exactly thinking it through in those terms, but implicitly you made a judgment about the benefits, expected benefits compared to the expected costs, and then you acted based on that judgment. And then at the end of this lecture period, you'll do some backward looking ex post assessment and decide if you were right or if you were wrong and you'll adjust your behavior going forward. That is exactly what entrepreneurs do. That, according to Ludwig von Mises, is the definition of entrepreneurship. In fact, Mises says in Human Action, he says the term entrepreneur, as used by economic theory, means acting man exclusively seen from the aspect of the uncertainty inherent in every action. Mises is trying to explicate for us in his treatise and his entire system, right, the nature and implications of human action. Well, outside of a few sort of abstract hypothetical scenarios that we can imagine in which you know exactly what's going to happen in the future, human action in the real world always involves some uncertainty. You don't, you don't know exactly if you'll receive, you know, if the means that you employ will bring about the end that you desire. Now, that doesn't mean people are ran, you know, act randomly or blindly, they're just sort of running around. No, I mean, human action is purposeful, right? To the best of their ability, people try to choose wisely to bring, you know, in situations where they have reason to expect the benefits will exceed the costs. Sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're wrong. So in this very broad sense, all human action is entrepreneurial. Mises goes on, he says, in using this term, thinking about entrepreneurship in this way, one must never forget that every action is embedded in the flux of time and therefore involves a speculation, right? Speculation here just means, you know, acting under conditions of uncertainty, anticipating certain benefits that you may or may not receive for sure. Now note, he says, the capitalists, the landowners, and the laborers are by necessity speculators. So is the consumer in providing for anticipated future needs. And then he quotes a, a now obscure English proverb, there's many a slip, twixt cup and lip, which I guess means, you know, as you're gonna take a drink, there's always a chance you might drop your $8 latte in your lap, right? And not get to enjoy, you know, the delicious, delicious beverage. So we understand what it means to say that capitalists are speculators, right, investors, they're investing resources where they expect to you know, earn an economic positive economic return, financial return. They're trying to avoid losses. Landowners are deciding how to employ their land. Should it be used for growing crops? Should I rent it to a developer to build houses or should I sell it, et cetera? In anticipation of future financial benefits from putting that land into one use or another, even leave, deciding to leave it idle, uh, to have it ready to use later would be another example of speculation in this sense. But even laborers, right? So you, you, know, you, you take a job for the day or for the week or for the year, you sign an employment contract, right? Now for some kinds of jobs, the actual monetary return is not certain ahead of time. Like you know, if you're in sales and you work on commission, right? Uh, so you're anticipating that with your abilities to sell and market conditions and the characteristics of the things you're selling, you know, I expect I'll be able to earn this much in, you know, wages plus bonus, whatever. Um, but even in a even in a case where your where your salary is fixed by contract, you know, there's uncertainty about uh, the costs of working that job. You know, how pleasant will the work environment be? Will I like my colleagues? Will I have a demanding boss? Uh, you know, will be will you know will the fringe benefits meet my expectations? Whatever. So even laborers are engaged in some speculation, right? Normally, for for terminological clarity, we don't describe workers as entrepreneurs for reasons that I'll uh, elaborate on in just a moment. But I mean, in Mises' broad sense, even the laborer is acting entrepreneurially. So is the consumer, right? I paid. $5 for the sandwich in anticipation of it satisfying my hunger, but I might, you know, it might be a bad sandwich. I might decide I don't like it. I might get indigestion. Uh, I buy a loaf of bread thinking I'll consume it during the week, but maybe it goes stale, you know, quickly than I imagined, right? 
all of us as purposeful human actors are engaged in speculation in this broad sense. And I says, said before, the benefits and costs may not be easily measurable. We may not have numbers to attach to them. Uh, the profit or loss, the net gain or net loss from the actions that we've undertaken, you know, they may not be quantifiable, may be subjective, but you can see that we're engaged in Mises terminology in an entrepreneurial act. Now, it is often convenient for us to use the language of entrepreneurship in a more specific sense as well. Namely, it may not be all that useful to describe, you know, the Mises University student who decided to go to the four o'clock lecture as an entrepreneur. I mean, it might be or might not be, depending on what we're analyzing or what research questions we're posing. But for many purposes, it's more useful to restrict the language of entrepreneurship to a, a, a special category of, you know, full-time professional commercial actors, you know, who are doing this, they're bearing uncertainty, but to try to earn financial rewards. Right, so they are, uh, you know, professional investors, business owners, traders, and manufacturers, and so forth. They invest financial resources, money. They buy capital equipment. They hire labor, etc., in anticipation of earning monetary revenues that exceed the monetary costs. You know, in in Sandy's lecture, you heard about, um, you know, the, the the need for a unit of calculation. And that's another reason why a monetary economy outperforms a, a barter economy, right? But if we have a monetary economy and we do have cardinal numbers to attach to revenues and costs, net gains and net losses, then we can engage in entrepreneurship in a, a sort of a deeper and, and oftentimes more successful way. The, the German economist Ludwig Lachmann, who was kind of a close fellow traveler of the Austrian school, wrote a very important book on capital, 1956, uh, it's called uh, uh, Capital and Its Structure. And in that book, he says, we are living in a world of unexpected change. In other words, a world of uncertainty, right? Uh, hence, capital combinations, resource combinations used in production will be ever-changing, will be dissolved and reformed. In this activity, we find the real function of the entrepreneur. So the real function of the entrepreneur is this arrangement and rearrangement of the factors of production, land, labor, capital, right, in anticipation of earning monetary revenues in excess of monetary costs, okay? Obviously, this is pretty darned important, right? This, this speculation, particularly by these professional commercial speculators, producers, capitalists, entrepreneurs, this is kind of what makes the world go around, as Mises describes it. Again, in Human Action, he says, it is impossible to eliminate the entrepreneur from the picture of a market economy. The various complementary factors of production cannot come together spontaneously. They need to be combined by the purpose of efforts of men, of persons, right, aimed at certain ends and motivated by the urge to improve their state of satisfaction. In eliminating the entrepreneur, one eliminates the driving force of the whole market system. So in, in, in a complex industrial economy, think of the goods and services that you consume, you know, your laptop or whatever. A laptop doesn't just miraculously appear, you know, by itself. Uh, it's not, you know, a tornado doesn't blow through and then it the wind assembles these components, you know, into a laptop, right? A laptop takes a lot of a, a long planning horizon. You know, think of all of the engineering, all of the design, things, uh, things that we've discovered over many years, the, the underlying science, the technological development, plus the manufacturing, the sourcing, you know, the supply chain issues, the marketing, the distribution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? A, a lot of people had to make decisions, purposeful decisions about allocating resources in, antip in anticipation of some gain in order to produce the kinds of goods and services uh, that we take for granted. And who's doing that? Well, it doesn't just happen on its own. The people who make those decisions and bear those uncertainties are the entrepreneurs. And they're the ones who are driving the process of production. Just as an aside, right, you, you may have heard uh, a, a term that was popularized by Hayek uh, that economics is the study of spontaneous order. 
a market economy is a spontaneously organized or spontaneously arranged system. Again, I mean, there, that's an insightful remark in a certain way, right? But, but it doesn't mean that you know, the economy miraculously self-organizes. Right? Hayek's making an argument against central planning, against top-down economy-wide central planning, but he's not claiming, Austrian economics does not claim Right, that at a micro level, right, that goods and services, firms, products, industries just sort of, you know, spontaneously emerge. No, somebody has to be doing the organizing, the design, the anticipation, the production. That's what entrepreneurs do. Entrepreneurs are at the heart of the market economy. Now, you'll be learning more this week, more details about how Austrians understand the production, the production process how Austrians understand uh, the notion of capitals. You probably know something about this already. If you've uh, studied Austrian business cycle theory, you know, you'll be hearing uh, more about it this week. The production is really, a, in the Austrian sense, about transformation of inputs into outputs. You know, raw materials and unskilled labor and so forth, things get combined successively through different stages into final goods and services with all their complexity and nuance. And the Austrian notion of uh, uh, production taking place in different stages and capital goods having characteristics uh, based on their place in this temporal production sequence is that's a unique contribution of Austrian economics to production theory, to business cycle theory, to economics at large. Uh, Sean Rittenauer will be lecturing on capital theory tomorrow. Uh, you'll also learn more about the Austrian concept of imputation which is simply the idea that the value and prices that uh, they can command on the market of the earlier stage components are determined by their marginal contribution to the final goods and services that are then consumed uh, in the market that consumers are willing to pay for. So it's the value of the outputs that is imputed to the inputs rather than the other way around. Right, if you've heard of like the uh, labor theory of value that was uh, uh, um, embraced by some of the classical economists and then of course more famously by Karl Marx, right? Claiming that outputs only have value because of the amount of input or the quality of inputs that go into them. Uh, Austrians say, no, that's, that has the causal chain reversed. It's only because the outputs that these inputs can produce have subjective value to consumers that the inputs themselves are traded on factor markets that entrepreneurs are willing to pay for them and so forth to put them into production. And of course, all of this uh, in a monetary economy takes place through economic calculation. And you'll learn more about that tomorrow from uh, Salerno. So you, you might have caught, I used in, in my opening sort of, you know, mini case or whatever, I used the term judgment. We're making judgments about the future. Uh, that is a term, I didn't choose that term by accident, um, that is a term that's used by Mises in his discussion of entrepreneurship. And some of you may also recognize that that term was used by Frank Knight, famous American economist who also wrote about uncertainty and entrepreneurship in the early 20th century. Um, the way I think about judgment, you know, th this sort of way that entrepreneurs grapple with the uncertain future, is it it's a way of decision making under uncertainty you know, in the absence of a formal mathematical model, formal decision model, or decision rule. In other words, there's no formula that tells me, you know, that told you, should you come to the lecture or not, right? As a producer, you know, should I, uh, you know, uh, put a higher generation of microprocessor in my laptop or not, right? Should I pursue this marketing campaign or not? Should I hire these workers or not? I don't have a mathematical formula into which I can plug certain data and then the computer tells me, or an AI tells me exactly what to do, right? Under conditions of probabilistic risk, which I'll, about which, uh, I'll say more about that in just a second, uh, we may have some decision tools that are useful, you know, rolling dice or uh, playing blackjack or something. But in, in, in the real world, uh, in, with the complexity of the real world, all the different variables, we don't have access to that kind of a model. Instead, we rely on something that you might call intuition or instinct or gut feeling. You know, you talk about making decisions based on your gut rather than some kind of calculation or 
uh, you know, the cognitive theorists talk about you know, system one thinking versus system two thinking. Okay, the Germans have a great word for this, verstehen, which is usually translated into English as understanding. But it's really, even that's not really a perfect translation. It's like a, a very sort of a deep fundamental understanding based on you know, knowledge uh, of particulars of time and place, as Hayek would call it. Okay, here's how Mises puts it. Again, I'm quoting from Human Action. The real entrepreneur is a speculator, a man eager to utilize his opinion about the future structure of the market for business operations promising profit. This specific anticipative understanding of the conditions of the uncertain future defies any rules and systematization. Okay, so we, it, it's not, there's not a formula for it. There's not a computer program that tells you exactly how you should anticipate the specific things that will happen in the future. Uh, this talent, he also says, it can be neither taught nor learned, which is a problem for me as an entrepreneurship professor, but we'll forget about that. <laughs> he says, the entrepreneur sees the past and present as other people do, but he judges the future in a different way. The entrepreneur relies on a, an idiosyncratic, subjective, possibly tacit judgment of future market conditions in order to make decisions about what to do. And uh, you know, one implication of this is that you know, the way that we exercise judgment, according to Mises, is by you know, having real resources at stake, right? Not just sort of thinking about it and maybe making a recommendation to someone else, but to exercise judgment, you've actually got to have skin in the game, as we call it nowadays. So there's a link between entrepreneurship as judgment and ownership the ownership that we normally associate with the capitalist function, which is why Mises talks about the capitalist entrepreneur. Okay, and in fact, I, one of my books that you can find downstairs is called The Capitalist and the Entrepreneur because it represents an attempt to show the importance of ownership as part of the, as a means by which entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial judgment is exercised. Um, let me just say a word about uncertainty. Um, you may have heard before of the distinction between uncertainty and risk. And this, is, this is, again, was popularized by, by Frank Knight. You might have heard the term Knightian uncertainty to refer to, you know, risk is I'm throwing dice, right? And if I have one die and it's like a normal die, I throw it. You know, I don't know what number will come up. But it's a very well-defined problem, right? There are six possible numbers, and if it's a, you know, unless I'm cheating, you know, the probability of any particular number coming up is one-sixth, okay? But if I'm, you know, I'm starting a business venture and I'm trying to figure out whether or not that business venture will be profitable, that's a very different kind of a problem, right? I mean, I don't know exactly what the relevant probabilities are. According to Mises, you really can't use that same kind of mathematical probability reasoning in a case like that. Rather, you're relying on this kind of more intuitive sense of what uh, you think will happen in the future. Now, there is another branch of probability theory, which I would argue is kind of the dominant one in mainstream economics and sort of mainstream decision theory. Um, and oddly enough, this was pioneered by John Maynard Keynes, the same, the same Keynes, same bad guy, right? Not in the general theory, but in an earlier book that coincidentally also came out in 1921. Uh, on, uh, in, which, in which Keynes argued that all probabilities are just subjective beliefs, right? They can be neither correct nor incorrect. They just are what they are. So Keynes would say, you know, if I believe that the probability of rolling a five on a normal die is one-eighth, that's just my belief. I mean, you can't tell me that's not correct. If I tell you I'm flipping a coin and it's 0.9, it's going to come up heads. Okay, well, that's just my belief. Now, what, what mainstream economists would say is, you know, the only thing that we can say about beliefs is that a rational person will choose to revise their beliefs or update their beliefs in a certain way, right? If you believe that when you flip a coin, it will come up heads nine times out of 10, and you keep flipping and flipping and flipping and flipping, eventually you'll realize, well, no, that can't be right. You know, about half the time I get tails, so I need to adjust my beliefs somehow. And you might have heard of a Bayes' law, 
or Bayesian updating as a technique by which decision makers, rational decision makers, are thought to update their beliefs. Now, Ludwig von Mises rejects this view of probability altogether. And you might say, well, wait a minute, I thought Austrian economics was all about subjectivism. Keynes's approach sounds like the most subjectivist at all. Isn't that the right one? No, no, that's not what Austrians mean by subjectivism, right? Austrian subjectivism doesn't, you know, it's not, uh, if David Gordon were here, he could, you know, he could articulate this more clearly in philosophical terms. Austrians are not making an ontological claim about the world, that the world operates by these sort of subjective, un not understandable or unintelligible principles. Right? It's just Austrians believe that you know, consumer preference is subjective. Okay? And, and, so, and, and judgments about the future under conditions of uncertainty are also subjective. Uh, Mises, so I, I don't know if you knew this, but Ludwig von Mises had a younger brother who was also a very accomplished academic. His name was Richard von Mises. Uh, Richard was a, a member of the Vienna Circle, a logical positivist in uh, uh, in the early 20th century, he became a professor in Germany, then he emigrated uh, to the US. He sort of he landed on his feet, became a famous professor at Harvard, uh, where he made contributions to a number of fields, including probability theory. Apparently, the two Mises brothers did not get along well. And I'm sure there's some good gossip, you know, underlying that. You can read Guido Holzman's biography of Mises to get a little more insight there. But two very brilliant men, but with different ideas about the world, but one thing they agreed on was probability theory. Okay, so one of the younger Mises contributions uh, is, is what is sometimes, in, the, in probability theory, they call it the frequentist approach. The frequentist theory of probability holds that what we mean by probability, that probabilities are sort of the, the, the limit frequency by which a certain event occurs in a series of repeated trials. In other words, suppose you had no idea what is the probability when you roll a die that a number five will come up. You know, for some reason, you just, you can't think it through. You, you, it's, you're just totally in the dark. You know, Keynes would say, you can just pick any arbitrary belief and that's fine. But uh, the younger Mises says, well, no, what we would do in a case like that is we would just roll the die, right? Roll it once, record what number comes down. Roll it again, record the number. Roll it again, keep rolling, rolling, and rolling, and rolling, and rolling. And, you know, mathematically, as the number of rolls approaches infinity, the frequency with which a five will come up is, will approach one-sixth. Same for all the numbers, Right, so a probability is what would happen in an infinite number of repetitions if we played this thing out, whatever it is, you know, how often would a particular event occur? Well, if it's, you know, 125th for whatever it is, okay, then 125th is the probability. That's what we mean when we say the probability is 125th, 16th, whatever it might be in a particular case. Problem with this is, of course, that, you know, if we're talking about rolling the dice, then we actually can roll the dice a whole bunch of times. And if you're worried that, oh, well, maybe, you know, my arm is not gonna be exactly at the same angle every time, okay, we can get a robot to do it. You know, put a robot in a clean, a vacuum sealed clean room. And I don't know if you're worried about the rotation of the earth, maybe we could do it like on a spaceship or something. But in theory, you could have exactly the same conditions and nothing would be relevant except pure chance to see which number kind of comes up. We could do that a bunch of times. You know, Peter Klein wants to start a restaurant in Auburn, Alabama to serve, you know, barbecue or maybe a food truck, park it in front of the Mises Institute. Okay. We can't do that a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times. You know, I mean, I can do it once and see what happens. And uh, yeah, maybe I could try again, but the circumstances wouldn't be exactly the same. It would be a different point in history. People's decision, preferences might have changed. My capabilities might be different. You know, market conditions, inflation, blah, blah, blah. You, we can't perform a repeated controlled experiment in these real world complicated conditions. Therefore, we don't have access to a limit frequency. It's impossible to, uh, to, to describe it in that way. So the, the language that the younger Mises uses, and, and Ludwig von Mises also adopts this terminology in human action, is in situations where each 
each item you're interested in, you know, each roll of the dice is an element of a class of homogeneous events, all other rolls of the dice, then we can apply this frequentist model and what uh, and Richard von Mises calls this class probability. So probability only applies to situations where you have an element that's part of a class and you can repeat and compare every element of the class is the same except for some random noise. Okay. On the other hand, if each situation you're interested in is a unique case, then we can't apply that kind of reasoning. We use judgment, intuition, gut feeling, for staying, and Mises calls that case probability. It's really not even probability. I mean, it should be like case non-probability, but he calls it case probability. Who am I to judge? Okay, so um, uh, entrepreneurship only applies to situations of case probability. When you're deciding how much to bet at the casino, at the roulette wheel, you're not engaged in entrepreneurship because you can mathematically calculate the likelihood that a certain number will come up, depending on how much wealth you have or can borrow, depending on how much you enjoy the thrill of playing the game, you know, your risk preferences. You can make a rational decision about you know, how much to bet on a number five or whatever. Okay? Business decision-making, entrepreneurial decision-making is not like that because we're dealing with unique cases. But by the way, if you say, well, but does that mean Austrian economics, as it understands probability, rejects subjectivism? The answer is no, because there is, look, I mean, this is ultimately about um, you know, behavior on the market, right? If an, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm making a pitch for my food truck, I go on Shark Tank, I make my spiel, try to get those, them to give me money, I go to the venture capital market, whatever. I'm trying to persuade other people that my case probability beliefs are sensible. And I've got all these arguments I present and maybe I have some charts and graphs or whatever, right? So, you know, even in situations where class probability might apply, you've got to, there's some subjective judgment in deciding what is or isn't in the class. You know, insurance contracts work this way, right? So if you've got, you know, you get driver's insurance or whatever, the insurance company is willing to sell you that insurance policy. They've estimated the likelihood that you, you know, this guy in the yellow shirt, that he is going to have an accident based on characteristics that we can observe, his age, his gender, where he lives, what kind of car he drives, his police record, you know, whatever. Based on all that, the insurance company estimates the likelihood that he'll have an accident and that's how they set their rates. Now you might say, uh, it Aust is it Austin? Austin? You might say, well, you know, so it, basically the insurance company is putting Austin in a class of a bunch of other people who are superficially similar to Austin and calculating the probability that way. And you say, but, but Austin's unique. He's different. He, he has a yellow shirt. I mean, he goes to Mises U, right? He's not like all the other people, his age and income level and you know, et cetera. Okay, that is the thing on which the trading parties have to make a judgment or a subjective assessment. What factors are relevant and what factors are not relevant to something being in a class. Okay, um, yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the contributions of Austrians to production is this notion that the value of inputs, factors of production we call them, is determined by the value of the outputs that they can be used to produce. So what Austrians call the, the, the marginal revenue product or the discounted marginal revenue product is the money revenue that can be attributed or imputed to one service unit of a factor, one hour of labor, one kilowatt hour of electricity, one uh, you know, unit of a raw material. Okay, holding all other factors constant discounted by the interest rate or social rate of time preference. Okay, so this, this number determines the entrepreneur's maximum willingness to pay for a factor. Right? If, if the factor is, you know, one hour of Manuel's labor, right, I believe that in one hour Manuel can produce, you know, three laptops. He's just the assembler. It's, let's make it easy, right? He can assemble three laptops, you know, which I can sell for a certain amount of money. Without Manuel, I would not be able to assemble those three laptops. So the additional revenue I get from selling that good or service based on an hour of Manuel's labor determines the maximum I would be willing to pay Manuel 
for an hour of his services. You know, I'd never pay more than that because then, then I'd be paying more, adding more to my costs than I would be adding to my revenues. I wouldn't do it, okay? Now, I, I would like to be able to hire him for much less than that, and then I'd have a little bit left over, but I mean, I would, I'd be willing to pay up to the discounted marginal revenue product of an hour, hour's worth of his labor for one hour of his labor. I would never pay more. I would never purposefully pay more, okay? So now, what if there are lots of entrepreneurs like me bidding for Manuel's services? Well, then he's not, you know, if his marginal revenue product, discounted marginal revenue product is $25 an hour, and I offer him 10, he's going to say, no, Salerno is paying 15. I'm going to go work for Salerno. And well, Mark Thornton's paying 20, right? And if all of us entrepreneurs have sort of the same beliefs about what an hour's worth of his labor, what an hour of his labor is worth, it's unlikely that any of us will be able to get him on the cheap, right? Competitive bidding by entrepreneurs will bid up the price of that input to where it's pretty close to the discounted marginal revenue product. There's some exceptions to that, which we can discuss later if you want. So if you imagine a kind of an equilibrium state, like what Rothbard and Mises call the evenly rotating economy, everything has already sort of been worked out uh, everybody knows what's going to happen in the future. I know exactly how many units of output Manuel can produce in an hour, and I know exactly how much I can sell those for on the market. Then I can precisely estimate his discounted marginal revenue product. Other entrepreneurs also correctly anticipate his discounted marginal revenue product. Everybody gets paid you know, exactly what they are worth to the entrepreneur. Uh, you know, owner managers of firms will get some, Rothbard calls it an implicit wage as a reward for their sort of managerial uh, function. Capitalists, if we assume there's still time preference in this imaginary construction, will get an interest return on advancing resources in production in advance of stuff getting produced. But there's nothing left over. Right, there's no residual profit or loss for the entrepreneur because what I have to pay for factors is exactly what those factors are worth to me in terms of how much revenue they generate. Why would we imagine such a crazy world? Well, only to contrast it with the actual world, in which we don't know for certain. I don't know for sure how much Manuel can produce, and I don't know for sure how much I can sell that additional output for on the market. So in the real world of uncertainty or case probability, entrepreneurs are competing for factors of production based on their knowledge and belief about the present, the state of technology, how much Manuel is capable of producing, how many Manuels there are out there and so forth, right? But also their anticipations of the future. Will people actually want to buy these additional units that Manuel's labor combined with other factors produces? I don't really know that for sure. Some entrepreneurs will be very skilled at making these anticipations. Others will be less skilled. And of course, the result is profit and loss, right? This is where profit and loss come from. Entrepreneurs who are more skilled than other entrepreneurs at anticipating future revenues, therefore can make more accurate assessments of what inputs are worth and will be better able to acquire inputs and still have something left over than entrepreneurs who overestimate what, the, you know, what will be the demand for the good or service produced. I happened to come across a Twitter feed of a guy last week, um, uh, Trung Phan is his name, I didn't know him before, but he has some pretty funny tweet threads. Uh, one was like on great, re, you know, great product failures Right, so in, in 2006, ESPN branded with some hardware company to produce an ESPN phone, uh, a flip phone. It was 400 bucks in 2006 with a hefty annual uh, monthly fee and you could only watch ESPN videos on it. Right, and you can see Steve Jobs apparently did not think very highly of the prospects of this product. Um, in the 1980s, IKEA introduced something called IKEA Air, which apparently was inflatable IKEA furniture, okay, which I guess in some sense is easier than putting it together. Um, Twitter introduced a, 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 a branded electronic device called Twitter Peak. You could only see 20 characters at a time, couldn't link to websites, cost 200 bucks. Um, my, one of my favorite examples of also is Harley Davidson Cologne, 
<laughs> if you want to smell like a Harley or you want to smell like somebody who rides a Harley, apparently you could get this. Um, so, you know, there are lots of examples. You know, we, we often think of the examples of the super successful products. Boy, that Steve Jobs was pretty clever with that iPhone, wasn't he? Right? Uh, you know, pick your favorite successful entrepreneur. Boy, Henry Ford, he really had it figured out. But of course, we don't, you know, if, if you hear people say, well, you know, the U.S. under capitalism is a profit system. I'd always say, well, you're half right, okay? It's a profit and loss system, right? Without the prospect of loss, there's no possibility of profit, right? Because, again, if, if, if you knew for sure what consumers would pay for stuff, then you would never overpay for the factors. You'd never be in the red, right? At worst, you'd break even, and if you're really skilled, if you're successful, you'll be able to get, get some factors and pay less than what you otherwise would have paid. Okay, um, there are some, you know, th there are other concepts of entrepreneurship in the literature, and I'll mention those briefly before we close. Um, you know, if you take a college level entrepreneurship class, they might emphasize kind of personality traits, charisma, leadership, persistence is one you often hear about. Uh, um, you know, whether or not these traits are associated with people who, you know, whether they are good predictors of entrepreneurial success is widely debated, probably not, and probably false. Uh, but, but these have nothing to do with entrepreneurship in the theoretical sense that we've been describing it, right? The successful entrepreneur in Mises' sense may or may not have charisma, may be a great leader, may not be. Those things are independent of entrepreneurial success in the formal sense. Um, a lot of times we use the language of entrepreneurship uh, to refer primarily to like a certain kind of business or a certain kind of firm. You know, entrepreneurship is startups and small, small businesses, maybe family businesses. But what large companies do is not entrepreneurship. Well, again, not according to Mises' definition. Entrepreneurship as the bearing of uncertainty under conditions of case probability is something that mature companies, large companies, all kinds of companies do it, right? It's not only companies that do it and so forth. It's not just about the tech sector. It's not just about firms that have patents or get VC or whatever. Um, one other uh, concept that you hear a lot about in both in the practitioner world and in the, some of the theoretical literature is that entrepreneurship is really about the pursuit of opportunity. And it's not clear what opportunity really means in this context. This notion comes from a famous entrepreneurship professor named Howard Stevenson, who established one of the first entrepreneurship programs at Harvard Business School back in the 1970s. And uh, uh, he, he, the, the, Howard Stevenson's definition of entrepreneurship is the following. Uh, entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled or beyond resources currently controlled. So in this sense, right, if you have access to capital, labor, other kinds of resources that you can put into productive use, well, then you're just kind of, you know, living within your means. You're just doing what anybody would do who has access to those valuable resources. There's nothing special about that. What it means to be entrepreneurial in this sense is, oh, I've got a vision, I've got a dream, I don't have any money, I don't have any skills, I don't have any, I don't know anybody, right? But my relentless pursuit of my dream, you know, in, in, in my relentless pursuit of my dream, I'll acquire the resources and capabilities that I need along the way. So it's trying to, this notion is trying to decouple entrepreneurship from resource ownership, from production, from the more practical or mundane aspects of it. And you hear, you get echoes of this in Israel Kirzner's famous definition of entrepreneurship which is quite popular in the Austrian literature. Uh, Kirzner articulated a notion of entrepreneurship as the discovery of opportunities not yet exploited by other actors. And like I say, it's been very influential in the Austrian literature. Um, it's meant to be in contrast to more mechanistic notions of optimal search, right? Entrepreneurs engage in serendipitous discovery you didn't even know you were looking for something, and boom, the idea just popped into my head in the shower for some successful company that I can start. Um, you know, I, again, problems with this include, in my view, the separation of entrepreneurship and production and resource ownership. 
again, the claim that pure discovery rather than investment is what drives the market is something I think is not quite right. Um, if you really want to understand this well, I don't have time to show you the clip, but I suggest you watch the scene from the movie Fargo where Jerry goes to his father-in-law and tries to get a loan, tries to get money to pursue an opportunity that's not defined very precisely. But um, anyway, watch that scene. Okay, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm gonna skip a couple of things that we can talk about in the Q&A, but I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, there's been some recent discussion of whether you have to have a market to have entrepreneurship. Right? Can the state be an entrepreneur? Can the government act entrepreneurially? There's a book by Mariana Matsukato that came out about 10 years ago and has been extremely influential, particularly in Europe, called The Entrepreneurial State, claiming that the state is really the driver of entrepreneurship and innovation. I mention this only because uh, I have a chapter in a book that came out three or four months ago called Questioning the Entrepreneurial State, which is available open access as a free download, which criticizes the Matsukato view, and I have a, a chapter arguing that government decision makers are not well positioned to be skilled at exercising entrepreneurial judgment in Mises' sense. So I think our, we're ready to have our discussion panel for the day, so thanks very much for coming to the talk. <laughs>